Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons that are prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. This is a series on managing for the Master till he comes. And this is lesson number six in that series for February 11 of 2023, entitled Laying Up Treasure in Heaven. Hmm. That sounds like a good idea. How do we go about that? Um, let's begin with a word of prayer. Our kind and loving Father, you've told us that we need to be cautious in the way we spend the money, the, what, what we use it for. Now, give us some guidance about the best way to invest the money that we have available. In this lesson is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. How should we decide what to invest in? Is a more important, and, and think of all the, I don't know how many I seem to be flooded with, maybe it's because I've recently retired, I don't know, but flooded with people who want you to do this and this and this, and you earn all this money right now and so forth. So how should we decide what to invest in? Is it more important to know the rate of return? Or how long will we before we will see results? Or what the final payout will be? Are you a financial advisor, Jim? No. <laughs> well, okay, it's your turn to read, I guess. Jesus gave us the world's best investment strategy he when he said, do not lay up for yourselves treasures, excuse me, treasures on earth where moth and, ru and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys or where thieves do not break in and steal. Matthew 6, verses 19 and 20 from the King, New King James Version. Jesus concluded, concludes his investment strategy by saying, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Matthew 6, 21 from the King, New King James Version. In other words, show me what you spend your money on and I will show you where your heart is because Wherever you put your money, your heart is sure to follow, if it is not there already. <laughs> if it's not there already, okay. Do you want a heart for the kingdom of God? If so, then put your money where it will reap eternal rewards. Put your time and your money and your prayer into God's work. If you do, you will soon become even more interested in that work, and your heart will follow as well. This week, we will review texts and illustrations that show us how to store a, up treasures in heaven and ultimately reap an eternal reward from the Bible study guide for January 4. Okay, what does it mean to, quote, put your time and your money and prayer into God's work? What do you think that means? It's what it says, I would think. Okay, how is it that related to all other responsibilities? How is that related to all other responsibilities and duties? How does that relate to caring for your family? Yeah. Is that part of the Lord's work? Earning a living, providing for your retirement, especially if you're growing older, some of us think about that. Why do you think it is that virtually all of the great heroes in the Old Testament were wealthy? Abraham wasn't exactly in debt, was he? And Noah, imagine where he got money to build that boat. And Moses, we don't, well, of course, you know, when he's out there leading the children of Israel through the desert, I guess their clothes didn't wear out and their, their, the, the manna was provided every day. What do you need beyond that? <laughs> Some of those wealthy individuals were asked to make major life alterations. Consider especially the stories of Noah, Abraham, and Moses. So how do you suppose Noah responded when God first told him to start building a large boat on the dry land? Did he have any questions about that? Sure he did. We've had the privilege of visiting the ark as there in northern Kentucky and built on biblical dimensions and so forth. It is amazing to see that. And I would encourage anyone who has a chance to go there uh, to go there and visit and see the, how, what an amazing structure it is. 
did Noah have numerous conversations with God before that occasion? I mean, what happens if you wake up in the middle of the night and you've got a dream that says, build an enormous boat on dry land, and you say, how are you going to respond to that, Carrie? <laughs> he, would have, he would have had to have asked God, how you, how, how is it to be done? Who, where do I get my men to cut the timber? Yeah. Uh, all, all that kind of stuff. Uh, there had to have been a lot of uh, prayer and... Do you think, do you think there were any, pre, any boats, big old boats made before that day? We don't have any reason to think there were, do we? No, I don't. This is like something brand new. Yes. And, you know, how often did God discuss... Well, he, he gave Noah instructions. Did he give them all those instructions in just one vision? Or did, did he talk pretty regularly to Moses? Yeah, do this now, do that, do that. Probably that. Some of it he might have been able to figure out, but anything that size... It would be... God had to help. That thing is huge. Yeah. I mean, in the wood they had in those days, Ellen White suggests that some of it was almost as hard as iron. Yeah. Well, it is probably the largest, the first big boat ever built. In Genesis 6, 5 to 14, when the Lord saw how wicked everyone on earth was and how evil their thoughts were all the time, he was sorry that he'd ever made them and put them on the earth. Now, that's a thing that a lot of people struggle with, that idea. This isn't God. God was sorry when he made man to start out with. He knew what was coming. But he knew that it had to be. He was so filled with regret that he said, I will wipe out these people I have created and also the animals and the birds because I am sorry that I made any of them. But the Lord was pleased with Noah. This is the story of Noah. He had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Noah had no faults and was the only good man of his time. He lived in, the, in fellowship with God, but everyone else was evil in God's sight and violence had spread everywhere. God looked at the world and saw that it was evil, for the people were all living evil lives. You wonder, how did Moses, you know, build a boat? I mean. Were there thieves there? You would have thought with all the material that he'd gathered to build that size of a boat, there would be people trying to steal it. God said to Noah, I've decided to put an end to the whole human race. I will destroy them completely because the world is full of their violent deeds. Build a boat for yourself out of good timber. And I wonder if Noah said, what's a boat? Make rooms in it and cover it with tar inside and out from our Bible study guide. I'm sorry, from the, our Good News Bible, the Holy Bible, the Good News Translation from the American Bible Society. So, many people in our day believe that evolution and uniformity, the idea that all things will continue just as they have in the past, is the answer to our origins and our future. I'm reading, listening to a book actually right now called Is Atheism Dead? by Eric Metaxas. I would really encourage you, if you have any questions about evolution, you should read that book. Many people before the flood had the same idea. We do not know why Noah stood out as different from all the rest of the world. However, he certainly did. Jim? From, from Ellen White, the world before the flood reasoned that for centuries the laws of nature had been fixed. The recurring seasons had come in their order. Heretofore, rain had fall, never fallen, and the earth had been watered by a mist or dew. The rivers had never yet passed their boundaries, but had home, excuse me, had borne their waters safely to the sea. Fixed decrees had never, excuse me, had kept the waters from overflowing their banks. Fixed. Okay, from the Patriarchs and Prophets, page 96 and 97. You wonder, I mean, if it had never rained ever, and Noah's building a boat and he says, there's going to be water covering the whole earth, Yeah, that would be a pretty hard case to make, wouldn't it? How was the water flowing up to the mountains to flow back to the sea if there was no rain and no lakes and what have you? So I admit maybe there's a little poetic license there. 
I don't know. <laughs> Living in a relatively peaceful world where almost everyone goes about his own business, how do you conceive, how do you convince, I'm sorry, a person that a disaster is coming? I mean, how will you, if you go out in the street here and try to convince people that the world is coming to an end, how do they usually respond? Yeah, ignore They've it. heard that before. I mean, that's, I mean, that's what Noah was trying to, do, trying to do, wasn't it? Yeah. How do you convince people to invest their time and their means toward God's goal? Carrie? Second uh, Peter 3, verses 3 to 7. First of all, you must understand that in these last days, some people will appear whose lives are controlled by their own lusts. They will mock you and will ask, he promised to come, didn't he? Where is he? Our ancestors have already died, but everything is still the same as it was since the creation of the world. Let me interrupt for just a second. <clears throat> I was taught when I was younger, if you run across someone who's an evolutionist and he says, ah, you can't believe the Bible and everything has all been the same for all the time. I say, well, did you know that the Bible predicts there would be people like you? So now you're the latest prediction I've seen. <laughs> you're added to the list. Uh, yeah, added to the list. Okay, there. Where was I? Verse 5. Uh, oh, yeah. They purposely ignore the fact that long ago God gave a command and the heavens and earth were created. The earth was formed out of water and by water, and it was also by water, the water of the flood, that the old world was destroyed. But the heavens and the earth that now exist are being preserved by the same command of God in order to be destroyed by fire. They are being kept for the day when godless people will be judged and destroyed. And that's from the Good News Bible. Okay, now... <clears throat> What would it require of you to, for you to pick up the me? I mean, what kind of a command would you need to get from God, and how would you know if it was God speaking to you that says, you know, pick up your, your roots here, and, well, Carrie, you, took, well, you went from Australia to America. How do you decide to do that? Think, think about Noah, and think about yeah. Moses, and think about Abraham. Would you be willing, what, how, what, would it, what would it take to convince you that you needed to pick up everything and move? Yeah. Well, you know, we see that today, these days, mm -hmm. and they've had trouble back in the East here of people being uh, interested in what they were told, and then they, we've lost people. It's... Uh, Something we need to keep in the back of our minds, yeah. I think. Okay, we know that there's going to come very difficult times that, as the end approaches and that we might have to go run and hide yeah. without taking anything with us. So, well, do we have any kind of instructions like that? Well, Ellen White is pretty clear what she says is going to happen at the very end. Is the Bible and God's instructions, is the Bible God's instructions to us? It really is, isn't it? I think so, yeah. Think of the story of Abram, Abram slash Abraham. He apparently lived a very comfortable life in a city surrounded by family and friends. Then God told him to pull up his roots and start on a long journey to an unknown, unknown destination. I mean, think about this for a moment. He wasn't just, you know, turning everything into cash and stowing it away in his bag and getting in his car and driving off. I mean, this guy was moving with huge, enormous herds and flocks and people who worked for him. I mean, it was a whole, like moving a whole city. Once again, we must ask ourselves this question. Had God talked to Abraham on other occasions before that? So here's what God said to him. Genesis 12, 1 to 3. The Lord said to Abram, Leave your country, your relatives, and your father's home. Go to a land that I'm going to show you. I will give you many descendants, and they will become a great nation. I will bless you and make your name famous, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, but I will curse those who curse you, and through you I will bless all the nations. Jim, you want to take the next one? From Ellen White. By faith Abraham when he had called to go out into a place which he had 
which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. And he went out, not knowing whither he went. Hebrews 11, 8 from the King James Version. Abraham's unquestioning obedience is one of the most striking evidences of faith to be found in all the Bible. From Ellen White, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 128, paragraph 2. Okay, now I have a question. We believe that faith is based on evidence. Okay, what evidence did Abraham, or Abram have before he left Haran, before he left Ur, actually? We wonder how, how much communication he'd had with, with uh, God prior to that, because yeah. uh, faith, another way of saying it is persuasion. So uh, and persuasion is something you come to the uh, conclusion based upon evidence mm -hmm. and conversation, learning that you can trust the one that is educating you, yeah. uh, as opposed to just the old de definition is something believing you know ain't true. Yeah. <laughs> so well, I, and that's, I, that's one way to interpret it, I think. I, as I said, I was listening yesterday to um, some person talking about evolution. Again, he says, people have suggested that faith is a leap into the dark. He said, no, faith is a leap into the light. <laughs> he said, I don't think that God has asked anybody to leap. I think yeah. remember, eternal life is to know the Father and the Son. That's a process. There's no quick, uh, quick yeah. uh, point in time. But there are times when we have to make decisions that say, okay, I'm going to choose to change directions now sure. and, 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 and go in a different direction. And that's based, has to be, hopefully is based on some solid evidence that you have before you decide to make that move. I agree. Yeah. Would we be willing to leave everything and embark on such a journey? Abraham lived a life full of unexpected requests from God. After following God's instructions for many years, he suddenly was asked to take his promised son to Mount Moriah and sacrifice him. And you remember that story, of course. Abraham was a wealthy herder and leader besides being a very successful evangelist and university director. University director, what do I mean by that? He was respected by almost all those around him. Tell, tell us more about that, Kerry. Uh, this is, Mrs. White had something to say about this. Abraham's household comprised more than a thousand souls. Those who were led by his teachings to worship the one God found a home in his encampment and here, as in a school, they received such instruction as would prepare them to be representatives of the true faith. Thus, a great responsibility rested upon him. He was training heads of families, and his methods of government would be carried out in the household over which they should provide, preside. Rather, And that's from Patriarchs and Prophets, page 141, paragraph 1. Wow. So how did Noah and Abraham develop a faith based on evidence that led them to make the decisions that they did to follow God's will? I just have to believe that God had regular communication with them. Remember, they had no Bible. They had no prophet to guide them. They had no Sabbath school or church group to, with which to participate. So how, did that re how does that relate to us in our day? And think of all the advantages we have. Second yeah. Corinthians 4.18 might give us some help. For we fix our attention not on things that are seen, but on things that are unseen. What can be seen lasts only for a time, but whatever, but what cannot be seen lasts forever. And you wonder if Paul's thoughts there were based on Plato's idea that, you know, anything you can touch is, is material and it's evil. Whereas the things that you can't touch, like the soul inside that's trapped in this body, you can't touch it, and that's good. It almost sounds a little bit like that, doesn't it? Yeah. By contrast, Lot made bad decisions. In his early years, he followed Uncle Abraham wherever he went. They both had flocks and herds and were very wealthy. After returning from their sojourn in Egypt, things became too crowded in the fields and the hills of Judea. So Abraham offered Lot the choice to go to wherever he wanted to move and settle. So why do you think Lot chose the valley of the Jordan River? 
Well, clearly from a hum purely human standpoint, it was the right thing to do. But as we know, Lot's story did not end well. After escaping with his life from the city of Sodom, losing his wife and then fathering sons by his two daughters, he ended up living in a cave rather than returning to... And I, this, one, this is something I, which is beyond me. I mean, you got the wealthiest man in the whole area is your uncle. Yeah. And he's rescued you from Sodom once. Remember, he, you know, he had, Abraham had rescued Lot when Sodom and Gomorrah were attacked and conquered by leaders from militant groups coming from the east. But Lot went back and moved into Sodom once again. Yeah. I mean, you just wonder what's going on there. Maybe he's attracted to the entertainment where he Well, there are some hints that his wife was from Sodom. That might have been a factor. Well, Genesis 8, 18 gives us the story of the end of Sodom and Gomorrah. Like many areas in Palestine in those days, the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah were consumed with fertility cult worship, sodomy, and idolatry. Did Abraham ever visit his nephew Lot in Sodom? Probably, probably not. <laughs> well, he, he, he managed to go down to the valley and chase those yeah, people who... Later on. First yeah. Later on. Yeah. How much did Abraham know about Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities? If Abraham had not traveled down to Sodom, what did people tell him about the lives of people living in the Jordan Valley? Did, did, did people talk about that? Sure they did. I mean, Abraham had to know, yeah. at least had some idea of what was going on down there. Surely Abraham must have visited Sodom when he rescued Lot and returned him to his home there. Did Abraham get any idea at that point in time of the kind of lives people were living in Sodom and Gomorrah? I mean, was how much of Sodom and Gomorrah was left after those people raided and tried to steal everything? We just don't know. When God visited Abraham in person with two angels, Abraham ended up having a very interesting conversation with the Lord. Genesis 18, 20 through 33. Then the Lord said to Abraham, there are terrible accusations against Sodom and Gomorrah, and their sin is very great. I must go down to find out whether or not the accusations to which I have heard are true, of which I've heard. So does that mean that God's com communication system isn't very adequate? I don't think I can. What? I would have no problem with God's communication system, but I think that's... Mm -hmm common no. human language he's trying to communicate yeah with. that's an anthropomorphism right. he's talking about God as if he were a human being then the two men left they were really angels as we know and went on towards Sodom but the Lord remained with Abraham Abraham approached the Lord and asked are you really going to destroy the innocent with the guilty now uh, kid, we, we, we have a pretty good idea what the condition of things was like in, in Sodom at that time. Yeah. If there are 50 innocent people in the city, will you destroy the whole city? Won't you spare it in order to save the 50? Surely you won't kill the innocent with the guilty. That's impossible. You can't do that. If you did, the innocent would be punished along with the guilty. That's impossible. The judge of all the earth has to do act, has to act justly. I mean, <laughs> would you dare, would you dare to say, God, God, shouldn't you do what's right? The Lord answered, If I find fifty innocent people in Sodom, I will spare the whole city for their sake. Abraham spoke again. Please forgive my boldness in continuing to speak to you, Lord. I'm only a man and have no right to say anything. Notice, but nope, but perhaps there will be only 45 innocent people instead of 50. Will you destroy the whole city because there are five too few? The Lord answered, I will not destroy the city if I find 45 innocent people. Abraham spoke again. Perhaps there will be only 40. He replied, I will not destroy it if there are 40. Abraham said, please don't be angry, Lord, but I must speak again. What if there are only 30? He said, I will not do it if there are five, 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 30. Abraham said, please forgive my boldness in continuing to speak to you, Lord. Suppose that only 20 are found. He said, I will not destroy this if I find 20. Abraham said, please don't be angry, Lord, and I will speak just one more time. What if only 10 are found? He said, I will not destroy it if there are 10. 
after he had finished speaking with Abraham, the Lord went away and Abraham returned home. So Abraham was convinced that God wasn't going to destroy anybody. Yeah. I mean, this, we, we've, in our, we've had enough history of disasters. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, you pointed out one a, few, a couple of weeks ago, uh, but that one in Russia years ago. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's enough disasters. God doesn't need to enter de, enter in and uh, do something. Uh, but yet, unfortunately, the way the Bible is written, it's God's doing something. You look a lot of those places. There's, I found at least six different names for that are attributed to God, but it, it comes across as God, but you have several different Elohims and so forth. Mm -hmm. And El Shaddai and El, Shad and El Shaddad and so forth, mm -hmm. which is a destroyer. But they're still translated into English as God. So yeah. we, get, we got some terrible problems with Bible translations. Would you consider that conversation between Abraham and Christ as a true example of prayer? Sure. If Abraham had asked Christ to spare the city, if there were only four righteous people there, how do you think Christ would have responded? <laughs> so would he consider? did with the ten. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The story of Jacob is one of numerous ups and downs. After following his mother's advice and deceiving his father, he had to flee from the wrath of his brother Esau. His mother advised him to run away to her brother's home in Haran. Sleeping with a rock for a pillow on the way to Haran, Jacob had that incredible vision of the ladder between earth and heaven. He saw angels going up, back and forth, you know. And if you woke up with a dream, like having had a dream like that, would you think that you just had an interesting dream? Or what would you think? And there he promised to return to God a faithful tithe. We do not know how he got the idea that 10% of his income should, go be, should be given back to God, and we do not know to whom he returned that 10%. What we do know is that after staying for 20 years with Uncle Laban, he finally escaped the enmity of Laban's sons, taking with him his two wives and two concubines and all his flocks and herds, and headed back for his father's home in Palestine. Carrie? It's coming from Genesis 32 verses 22 to 31. That same night, Jacob got up, took his two wives, his two concubines, and his 11 children, and crossed the river Jab Jabbok. After he had sent them across, he also sent across all that he owned, but he stayed behind alone. Then a man came and wrestled with him until just before daybreak. When the man saw that he was not winning the struggle, he struck Jacob on the hip and it was thrown out of joint. The man said, let me go, daylight is coming. I won't unless you bless me, Jacob answered. What is your name, the man asked. Jacob, he answered. The man said, your name will no longer be Jacob. You have struggled with God and with men and you have won, so your name will be Israel. Jacob said, now tell me your name. But he answered, why do you want to know my name? Then he blessed Jacob. Jacob said, I have seen God face to face and I am still alive. So he named the place Peniel. The sun rose as Jacob was leaving Peniel and he was limping because of his hip. It's from the Good News Bible. That's quite a story. You, you, don't, yeah. you wonder what was going on there exactly, and obviously, um, I mean, how could you fight with somebody that you couldn't see? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, did he, he obviously saw something, or at least felt something. Yeah. And how long did that battle go on? Well, you got, whatever, was it Ephesians 6, 12? Wrestle not against flesh yeah. and blood, but against the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. So maybe this wasn't Yahweh. This was, might have been another... Well, but he blessed him when it was all done. Well, he might have not had much uh, choice in the matter. Yeah. I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't want the blessing of the devil. Well, <laughs> then again, a lot of it might be a perception on the part of uh, Jacob, too. How much did Jacob see of the being that attacked him? What led him to ask for a blessing in the end? Boy. Jacob ended up spending the last few years of his life in Egypt under the care of his son, Joseph, 
would become a prime minister by that time. Before he died, he asked to be taken back to Palestine and buried with Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Rebecca, and Leah in the cave of Machpelah. And years and years and years ago, when things were a little more free, we were, my wife and I were traveling with our young children, and we were able to visit that place and see the supposedly the tombs of those people. It's very difficult to visit there now because uh, it's right in, it's that, that church, that whatever you want to call it, the, the Muslims cons consider it's a mosque and the Jews consider that it's a synagogue and they actually have a dividing thing that goes right through the middle of that church. So the, the Jews come in on one side and they can worship there and do what they want and the Muslims come in on the other side and they worship there and do what they want and they, I guess you can see, well, you can see into the middle part where the caskets and so forth are. Crazy. We live in a world where lives are relatively short. God's plan for us was that we should live forever. How important is it that we keep in mind God's long-term plans for us, even if we should die? I mean, how much of our plans involve the eternal. I mean, uh, let us consider what I say. A lot of it. Well, if if it's so, then we are certainly different than the average person living on the world today. Most people, they, eternity have it's hardly hardly they have no passes idea. their mind. They've been brainwashed with uh, evolutionary and uh, Darwinian. Yeah. Well, think about Moses. This is another character we want to talk about. Think of his childhood. He was supposed to have been thrown into the river and killed as an infant. However, instead, he was adopted by Pharaoh's daughter, but still spent his first 12 years with his parents. And you can imagine that his parents and his sister and his brother, all working together, must have done everything they could to make sure he knew everything that they could possibly teach him in those 12, those 12 years. L look at Hebrews 20, 11, 24 to 29. It was faith that made it Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of the king's daughter. He preferred to suffer with God's people rather than to enjoy sin for a little while. He reckoned, but I mean, you know, he was 40 years in the palace. I, wouldn't you call that enjoying sin? <laughs> I don't know. He reckoned that to suffer scorn for the Messiah was worth far more than all the treasures of Egypt, for he kept his eyes on the future reward, and that obviously had to be because of his training by his family. It was faith that made Moses leave Egypt without being afraid of the king's anger, as though he saw the invisible God who refused to turn back. It was faith that made him establish the Passover and order the blood to be sprinkled on the door so that the angel of death would not kill the firstborn sons of the Israelites. So um, he made, he trusted in God, he made the right choices to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt. How do you think Moses maintained that faith relationship with God that made him to be such an example for all his followers and those of us down to our day? I mean, what would you do for 40 years out there herding sheep? Yeah. What, how did that affect his faith? And he had no Bible. He hadn't written any of it yet. <laughs> you know? Well, that's not true. He wrote Job and Genesis when he was out there herding sheep. Try to imagine the incredible miracles that Moses, under God's guidance, was able to perform in order to get the children of Israel out of Egypt, through the Red Sea, and finally into the land of Canaan. Imagine having, you know, living through that, all those experiences. Wow. Hebrews 11, 29. Jim? <clears throat> it was faith that made the Israelites able to cross the Red Sea as if on dry land. When the Egyptians tried to do it, the water swallowed them up from the Good News Bible. How good was the faith of the Israelites at that point in time? They probably did it in the dark, didn't they? Maybe. So I don't know how much faith there was. Well, they had the cloud, remember? Yeah, and it fought, they've been following some distance. Yeah. So, so. so how would you describe the faith of the Israelites just before God led them across the Red Sea? 
You wonder were there some of them who primitive were, at best. Yeah, were there some of them who refused refused to get in because they were afraid of what would happen? Were they confident in, in their leadership, <clears throat> or were they terrified? I, 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 I've said this many times, but I'll say it again. I try to put myself into these situations. Did any of the kids try to throw rocks at the at the at the walls of water on the sides? <laughs> you know, you know what? Egypt was probably the most powerful nation in the world in the days of Moses. Should Moses have just remained in Egypt until he became Pharaoh and then arrange for the children of Israel to leave? What would be wrong with that? They needed Moses to lead them. <laughs> they needed him desperately. Well, unfortunately, things didn't work out perfectly at the end. Numbers 20, 10 to 13. Kerry? He and Aaron assembled the whole community in front of the rock. And Moses said, listen, you rebels, do you have to get water out of this rock for you? Then Moses raised the stick and struck the rock twice with it. And in brackets, as on a previous occasion, Moses had been instructed by God. And a great stream of water gushed out, and all the people and animals drank. Okay, let me interrupt for a second. Remember, there were two different occasions. The first time, God said, strike the rock through two times, and the water gushed out. And the second time, what did he say? He was annoyed somewhere. Just, just speak to the rock. And Moses got was so annoyed with the people that he forgot where he was doing and he was only 120 years old or whatever. No, he was, no, he was, he was still only 80 at that point in time, wasn't he? This was near the beginning. So he struck the rock again. So, um, Must we bring forth water for you miserable wretches? Exactly. <clears throat> okay, verse 12. But Carrie? the Lord reprimanded Moses and Aaron. He said, because you did not have enough faith to acknowledge my holy power before the people of Israel, you will not lead them into the land that I promised to give them. Now let, let me interrupt there for a second also. You did not have enough faith. He doesn't say because you struck the rock. It says because you didn't have enough faith. What does that mean? implies that uh, Moses was uh, still learning something, wasn't he? Yeah. Uh, he, obviously, he didn't trust God enough to just speak to the rock like God had told him. He wasn't fully persuaded. Yeah. Yeah. He was still had some learning to do. Okay, 13. This happened at Meribah, where the people of Israel complained against the Lord and where he showed them that he was holy. That's from the Good so News now, Bible. If Moses was such a great example of faith, what happened there at Meribah? What, did, what led God to make such a decision regarding two of his best? I mean, if you had looked down on that and you were watching those, that crowd out of Egypt, wouldn't you have said that Abraham, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Moses and Aaron were probably the two best of the whole lot? Yeah. Moses and Abraham you're talking about? Or Mo Moses, Moses and Aaron. And Aaron. Okay. Sorry, Moses and Aaron. Yeah. And yet, <laughs> they had a, a lot of growing yet to do. Apparently, look, look, and well, look at what happened when they came out of the uh, out of the forty years of wilderness. Yeah. Before they uh, in Amos what five twenty five and following, mm -hmm. uh, they were still yeah. a bunch of pagans. Yeah, that was a long time later, but you're right. But still, yeah. <laughs> they had they had all these evidences. I mean, talk about the patience and uh, long suffering on the part of uh, God. Yeah. Well, consider these words of words about Abraham, and then we have one passage about Abraham and one about Moses. Where are we? And that's mine, I guess. The heritage that God has promised to his people is not in this world. Abraham had no possessions in the earth, no, not so much as to set his foot on, Acts 7, 5. He possessed great substance, and all his flocks and herds, and he used it to the glory of God and the good of his fellow man. But he did not look upon this world as his home. The Lord had called him to leave his idolatrous countrymen with the promise of the land of Canaan as an everlasting possession. Yet neither he nor his son nor his son's son received it. 
when Abraham desired a burial place for his dead, he had to buy it out of, of the Canaanites. His sole possession in the land of promise was that rock-hewn tomb in the cave of Machpelah. Patriarchs and Prophets 169, that of course is from Ellen White. Okay, Jim, what did he say about Moses? Ellen White also said, the magnificent palace of Pharaoh and the monarch throne, th excuse me, and the monarch's throne were held out as an inducement to Moses. But he knew that the sinful pleasures that make men forget God were in its lordly courts. He looked beyond the gorgeous palace, beyond a monarch's crown, to the highly, excuse me, to the high honors that will be, excuse me, that will be bestowed on the saints of the Most High in the kingdom untainted by sin. He saw that faith an imperishable by faith. By faith an imperishable crown that the king of heaven would place on the brow of the overcomer this faith led him to turn away from the glory lordly ones of earth and to join the humble poor despised nation that had chosen to obey god rather than to serve sin from ellen white patriarchs and prophets page 246 paragraph one and where did moses end up well, in heaven, according to the He ended up in heaven. We understand. We need to be constantly aware of the fact that apart from God's blessing, we would not only have nothing, but also we wouldn't even be alive. And no matter how much we might gain during this earthly life, all of that would be for nothing if we survive only until the second coming of Jesus. So Jesus advised us to store up riches in heaven where thieves cannot rob and moths cannot destroy. So, did Moses' parents teach him anything about the future that had been promised to Israel? Surely they must have. Yeah. Did he ever get the idea that he might be part of that future? Probably. Later, how did Moses compare? Now, think about this. Now, let's go down many years later. Moses is, he was resurrected. He died, but he was resurrected, taken to heaven. How did Moses compare the palaces in Egypt with his new home in the heavenly kingdom when he, when he got there? <laughs> he must have looked down on those palaces in Egypt. He thought, those poor people down there, <laughs> you know? Noah was no doubt a great example of faith. We know almost nothing about his personal life before, during, or after the flood. We know a great deal more about the experience of Abraham after having been promised a son, Abraham had to wait 25 years. Finally, God came to Abraham, and this is what happened. Carrie? Genesis 17, verse 16. I will bless her, and I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she will become the mother of nations, and there will be kings among her descendants. Abraham bowed down with his face touching the ground, but he began to laugh when he thought, can a man have a child when he's a hundred years old? Can Sarah have a child at 90? He asked God, why not let Ishmael be my heir? Genesis 18, eight. 9 to 8, 15. Okay, this is the next time God visited, okay. Then they asked him, where is your wife Sarah? She is in there in the tent, he answered. One of them said, nine months from now, I will come back and your wife, Sarah, will have a son. Wow. <laughs> but I want to stop for just a second. Think about this. You know, here's these three supposedly strangers come walking along, you know, and Abraham rushes out and says, well, stop and, and let's, let's chat. I'll, I'll get some food for you and so forth. And a little while later, one of them says, I'll be back in about nine months and Sarah will have a son. And you're saying... <laughs> <laughs> Hold on, what's going on here, right? Yeah. Sarah was behind him at the door of the tent listening. Abraham and Sarah were very old and Sarah had stopped having her monthly periods. So Sarah laughed to herself and said, now that I am old and worn out, can I still enjoy sex? And besides, my husband is old too. Then the Lord asked Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, can I really have a child when I'm too old? So old, rather. Is anything too hard for the Lord? As I said, nine months from now, I will return and Sarah will have a son. 
Now there's a clue in there that we may not immediately recognize. Notice in verses 13 and verse 14, the Lord is in small caps. The name Lord is, in, is capitalized. What does that mean? Both of you should know that. Yeah, that's Yahweh. That's the personal name for God, Yahweh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay? Yeah, As I said? Uh, yes, nine months from now I will return and Sarah will have a son. Because Sarah was afraid, she denied it. I didn't laugh, she <clears> said. <throat> yes, you did, he replied. You laughed, and that comes from the Good News Bible. So, question. Is it all right to laugh at what God tells you and then to lie about it? Probably not the best thing you could do. <laughs> God rewarded Abraham and Sarah despite their laughter and lies. Later, they named their son Isaac, which means laughter, or she or he laughs. Considering all of that, Abraham was willing to offer his son on the altar when God asked him to. Of course, we know that God eventually provided a substitute. We've already studied many passages in Scripture warning us of the deceitfulness of riches. It certainly meant disaster for Lot. Okay, ultimately the real question is, how are we supposed to store up treasures in heaven? You remember these verses, Matthew 6, 19 and 20. Do not store up riches for yourselves here on earth, but where moths and rust destroy and robbers break in and steal. Instead, store up riches to yourselves in heaven, where moths and rust cannot destroy and robbers cannot break in and steal. For your heart will always be where your riches are. Hmm. How do we invest in heaven? Is there a bank somewhere that you go in and deposit your money? Earthly treasures are blessings when rightly used. Those who have them should realize that they are lent them of God and should cheerfully spend their means to advance his cause. Testimonies for the Church from Ellen White, Volume 1, 141. And Testimonies for the Church, Volume 1, was, when was that written? Do you remember? 1850s. Yeah. Our Bible study guide, those who love money will never have enough of it. Ecclesiastes 5.10. Paul tells us that this love is the root of all evil, 1 Timothy 6.10. The way we use our money is a test of faithfulness for eternity, Luke 16.10 and 11. But if our money is invested only in worldly undertakings, we will love mammon more than God, Luke 16.13. Let me just read that to you. No servant can be the slave of two masters. Such a servant will hate one and love the other, or he will loyal, be loyal to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. God wants our hearts, Proverbs 23, 26, and we can offer them to him by investing in his work. Therefore, we will make friends among those with, who will receive us in the everlasting habitations, where we will love and serve God, not possessions. Adult Teacher Sabbath School Bible Study, Study Guide, page 81. Do you believe the words of Paul that he wrote in 1 Timothy 6.10? Jim? The mine, 1 Timothy 6, verse 10. For the love of money is the source of all kinds of evil. Some have been eager, eager to, excuse me, been so eager to have it that they have wandered away from the faith and have broken their hearts with many sorrows, Good News Bible. Okay, most people in our world today would consider money to be a great blessing. How can it be a source of all kinds of evil? I mean, if you walked out on the street or walked into a business somewhere and you said, do you want a lot of money or do you want a little bit of money? Do you think money is a blessing? Well, the text says the love of money. Yeah. Now, this doesn't, this is, a bit, we quibble over that, yeah. but it is, I mean, having money, some people are better able to handle it than others. Yeah, yeah. And how many people in our world today think that God has given them money to use for his cause? <laughs> they don't even know what you're talking about, most of them. Yeah. Well, okay, Bible study guide, Kerry. Uh, where? Right in the middle, just Turn below the middle. Okay, okay. 
Uh, most people in our world today would consider money to be a great blessing. How can it be a source of all kinds of evil? In terms of sin, heaven invested the blood of Jesus in our salvation. Jesus, the Lamb who was slain before the foundation of the world, 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, gave us the promise that the Holy Spirit would remain with us always as assurance of our redemption. That's per Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. The blood of martyrs is a most precious investment that was shed for God's word. That's from Revelation 6, 9 and 10. Let me just look at those verses. What, what, what does it mean? Well, let, let's look at these first, 6, 9 and 10. Then the Lamb broke open the fifth seal. I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been killed because they had proclaimed God's word and had been faithful in their witnessing. They shouted in a loud voice, Almighty Lord, holy and true, how long will it be until you judge the people on earth and punish them for killing us? Does that sound like investing their blood? Yeah, I guess so. Huh? Well, their blood was shed for God's word. We could buy that. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Uh, in terms of sin, heaven invested the blood of Jesus in our salvation. Jesus the Lamb, who was slain before the foundation of the world, this is from 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, gave us the promise that the Holy Spirit would remain with us always as assurance of our redemption. Ephesians 1, 13, 14. The blood of martyrs is a most precious investment that was shed for God's word. It's from Revelation 6, 9 and 10. The dead in Christ are investors waiting for an inheritance that includes the end of sin and the restoration of all things. That's from 2 Peter 3, 13. Uh, and Revelation 21, 1 to 7 from our Bible study yeah, guide. Yeah. So what does invested the blood of Jesus mean? How is blood an investment? If someone says, I'm offering you an investment, what does that mean to you? I'd be suspicious. <laughs> what are the strings attached to? What are the strings attached? Yeah. Well, you normally think of investment as something where you, you, you give something you offer something, you pay something, whatever, and you expect some kind of response, right? You, you expect yeah. to, to, to gain what you invested plus something else, right? Yeah. So when God invested the blood of Jesus, did he get, the, did he get Jesus back? He did. He did yeah. And he's hoping to get a whole lot more out of that. He's supposed to be hoping to get all the righteous people back as well, right? Yeah. Okay. 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, For you know what was paid to set you free from the worthless manner of life handed down by your ancestors. It was not something that can be destroyed, such as silver or gold. It was a costly sacrifice of Christ, who was like a lamb without defect or flaw. What did Paul think, or what did Peter think of their, their previous lives? Pretty worthless, huh? Ephesians 1, 13 and 14, And you also became God's people when you heard the true message, the good news that brought you salvation. You believed in Christ, and God put his stamp of ownership on you by giving you the Holy Spirit he had promised. The Spirit is a guarantee that we shall receive what God has promised his people, and, is, and this assures us that God will give complete freedom to those who are his. Let us praise his glory. So now, Look at some conclusions. How many Seventh-day Adventist Christians in our day are, inve are investing their lives and possessions in the spreading of the gospel? What percentage of Adventists are making significant contributions to the spreading of the gospel? You want to make a wild guess? You said something earlier about, what was it, 20 or 25? 25 percent that, that are paying a faithful tithe. Right, right. Is that a clue for the answer to this question? I think it could be. We know that there are people in some parts of the world that are risking their lives every day to witness yes. about God, and, and they do it voluntarily. 
let us be honest, there are a lot of external forces impacting our lives, trying to prevent us from doing what God asks us to do. And of course, who's behind all of that? The devil. The devil, of course. Even impulses from within our own naturally selfish hearts would lead us to lust and sin. However, despite all of that, we can be faithful to God and do His will. It may not be easy. 2 Timothy 3.12 Everyone who wants to live a godly life in union with Christ Jesus will be, what? Persecuted. Persecuted. Noah, Abraham, and Moses received direct instructions from God as to what they were supposed to do. Should we expect that kind of direct instructions? Will God ever give us direct instructions? Now's the time to flee the cities or whatever? Or do we already have adequate instruction in God's Word? Well, I think... When things really come unstuck, I think God's going to be around somewhere. Yeah. Can we afford to ignore public opinion and even scientific interpretations? How do we relate to knowing and doing God's will? What kinds of perils faced Abraham and his large group of travelers as they journeyed to that unknown place to which God was taking them? Were they ever stopped and challenged about their progress? Imagine, or for that matter, did anybody ever try to steal all those, all some of their animals or whatever? Imagine Moses with Aaron by his side, challenging Pharaoh, the most powerful man in the world. But Moses trusted God's directions and he succeeded. Psychologically, people give priority to the immediate fulfillment of their desires and urgent needs, or to those needs and desires that are before their eyes. In reality, hope deferred discourages. Therefore, patience is required to wait for the fulfillment of God's promises according to His perfect timing. Human beings tend to seek instant gratification, wanting to hasten the fulfillment of the promises and the attainment of their uh, expectations. How can we keep our faith strong, trusting God and His directors, directions, investing in God's Word work? Jim, we got just a few seconds left. Walk the narrow plank of faith. Trust all in the promises of the Lord. Trust God in darkness. That is the time to have faith. Ellen White, Testimonies of the Church, Volume 1, page 167. Yeah. Well, we've studied the lives of Moses and Jacob and Lot and Abraham and Noah, and I hope that you've gotten some ideas about what is the right way to go and what's not the right way to go. Let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, we have come once again to study a word together, to think about it, to think of the ways in which we should go, help us not to make the mistakes that Lot did, but rather to move forward as, as Noah did, as Moses did, as Abraham did, is our prayer in Jesus' name, amen. amen.